there's like heat. Amazing the things you're thankful for when they are ripped out of your hands by ice. Anyway, I want to give you guys a little update on uh, what's going on in my life. Uh, I turned 34 this last week, which is kind of crazy. Uh, I had my birthday party canceled twice. Um, <laughs> yeah, really sad. Um, also, Kristen and I, sadly, one of our kids is sick and doesn't feel good, so she's not here. But Chris and I put an offer on a house and got it accepted in the middle of the ice storm also. So, we, yeah, there's lots of crazy stuff happening. But um, other than that, man, no power, not very much fun. Again, glad to be here with you guys in the warmth of your love and the heat of the building. Okay. No more snow jokes. I'm done with it. Okay. Last week, we finished our spiritual practice on Scripture, which, because of the snow and the, the ice, and there was like no snow, actually. I don't know why I said snow. Because of the ice, we did an online service, and um, not very many people were able to watch it because of the power or their internet being out, and I was not able to post that. Uh, so this week, now that the internet's back, we got power. I will post that, and hopefully, if you missed that, you can catch up with that on our YouTube or our podcast, so check that out when you have a chance, because, uh, yeah, we finished up that practice, and today, we are going to not do that. We're going to talk about Matthew. So, all that being said, kind of all jumbled. I'm a wreck from this last week. I need to pray need to get myself right before the Lord, and hopefully we can uh, learn about Jesus together. So let's do that. Uh, Lord, we just thank you for tonight. Thank you that we're here together. Uh, Lord, we really do truly thank you that um, we live in a place where there is electricity and God warmth during the winter, and it's just amazing how much you have blessed us and continue to allow us to be together even when uh, times get tough, so we thank you for that. We thank you for uh, just the, the love that you've shown us. Uh, tonight, we just pray that, Lord, you would be glorified. Lord, we'd learn more about you through uh, your word tonight. Uh, and Lord, would you please uh, just remind us about who you are, what we're, what we're here for, and Lord, we just give you this moment now to, uh, yeah, open our minds and our hearts to you. We love you, Jesus. We pray these things in your name. Amen. Okay, so we are in Matthew chapter 9, and we're doing verses 27 through 31. I'm going to read these verses, and we'll talk about it. It'll be awesome. So if you got your Bibles, open them up there. You got your app, turn or poke there. Wait, that's not right. Touch the right spot. You got it. Okay. Um, Matthew 9, 27 through 31. Man, my mind totally is crazy today. I love you guys, so I apologize if Matthew sounds a little crazy, but I'm going to read this, and we'll go. As Jesus went on from there, two blind men followed him, calling out, have mercy on us, son of David. When, we have had, when he had gone indoors, the blind men came to him, and he asked them, do you believe that I'm able to do this? Yes, Lord, they replied. Then he touched their eyes and said, according to your faith, let it be done to you and their sight was restored. Jesus warned them sternly, see that no one knows about this. But they went out and spread the news about him all over the region. Okay, so it starts off with, as Jesus went. So this is just one of those little phrases that gives us a hint we need to look back and remember a little bit. So this is a little bit of a rewind. Uh, Jesus had just been approached by John, uh, John the Baptist's disciples and asked, why don't your disciples uh, fast like the rest of us? And he describes to them that, hey, there's this new kingdom coming, and those old ways don't fit with the new ways. So that is why my disciples do not fast. And all in the same instance, he starts healing people. So there's this woman who's been bleeding throughout her entire life, and touches Jesus' cloak and is healed. And not only is she healed, she is now able to join society because that uh, type, 
of bleeding made her unclean and not able to be with the rest of the people. Then he brings a girl back to life. And the phrase in there that's kind of funny to me is like, she was sleeping. Ah, but to Jesus, death is as serious as a little nap, apparently. And this new kingdom that Jesus is ushering in has, a, it's just different than anyone has ever thought it would be, more than anyone would ever expect. So when it says, as Jesus went on from there, that's what just happened. So as Jesus went on from there, two blind men followed him. Okay. So back in the day, blind, this was pretty common, either happened from infection or literally an eye getting poked out by a stick, like those things your parents used to tell you when you were a kid. Hey, be careful or you poke someone's eye out. That was actually a big deal back then because there were no, <laughs> nobody could fix stuff that happened with your eyes. When you went blind, you just went blind, and there was nothing a doctor could do. So there was a lot of these people going all over the place blind, and they find Jesus, and they ask him to have mercy on them. Heal my blindness. And they called him something very, very important. They called him the son of David. So what does this mean? And why is son of David an important name? So let's look at the Old Testament real quick. So in 2 Samuel, we, we see King David. He has just taken Jerusalem back from the Jebusites and defeats the Philistines, kicks them out of Jerusalem, wins the day, and David wants to build the Ark of the, or a temple to hold the Ark of the Lord because he's like, oh, I'm, I need to build something magnificent for the Lord. And the Lord goes on to tell him, hey, you were just a shepherd not too long ago, and I brought you up from nothing, and now you are the king. But along with that, he makes a promise to him. In 2 Samuel 7, 11 through 16, it says, the Lord declares to you that the Lord himself will establish a house for you. When your days are over and you rest with your ancestors, I will raise up your offspring to succeed you, your own flesh and blood, and I will establish this kingdom, uh, his kingdom. He is the one who will build a house for my name, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. I will be his father, and he will be my son. When he does wrong, I will punish him with a rod wielded by men, with floggings inflicted by human hands, but my love will never be taken away from him. As I took it away from Saul, whom I removed from before you, your house and your kingdom will endure forever before me. Your throne will be established forever. So the Lord is going to establish his kingdom through the line of David. So son of David is a messianic uh, name for this the Messiah is going to come from the line of David. So when the blind men call him son of David, they are essentially saying, you're the Messiah. You come from that line. You have to be the chosen one. So it appears these men believe Jesus is the Messiah. And in verse 28, they go inside. The blind men go to him, and uh, Jesus asks them, point blank, do you believe that I am able to do this? Do you believe that I'm able to do this? That's such a simple, simple question. But they reply super confidently, yes, Lord. And when we look at the word Lord they used, it implies not just like, yes, like my leader of, or someone of power, this Lord means like, ooh, this has like, more than a prophet, you are my Lord and Savior type Lord. The Pillar, New Ta uh, the, the Pillar New Testament commentary states, there are no miracles of the giving of sight in the Old Testament. So that being said, these guys are going to Jesus, calling him the son of David. You are the Messiah. And the fact that there are no miracles even like there's references to like the heart, those eye, the eyes of the heart being opened, but no actual physical miracle happening where blindness 
is healed, where sight is given. So these guys are going to Jesus fully believing that something that has never been healed by the Lord before is going to take place. It also says in that same uh, commentary that the giving of sight is a divine activity. That is something that, like I said, not a doctor, nothing could cure blindness. On top of that, the Old Testament also talks about the, the, the Messiah. In Isaiah 29, 18, it says, in that day the deaf will hear the words of the the words of the scroll, talking about when the Lord comes, when Jesus comes, and out of gloom and darkness, the eyes of the blind will see. So these men believe Jesus will truly heal their sight. The men are saying, yes, Lord, with their words, and yes, Lord, with their beliefs. And verse 29 says, then he touched their eyes and said, according to your faith, let it be done to you. So Jesus, kind of like with uh, all the people that he's healed so far, has been super personal. R remember, these are blind people. They can't see anything. And physical touch would have been something that was very like heightened for them. So for Jesus to touch their eyes is something significant. And he says, according to your faith, meaning like your faith, the faith that you have in me is the reason that this is happening. That is the base for this healing. Not the amount of faith, not the, not like their society, uh, where they rest in society or the color of their skin, just faith. And their sight was restored. Like, instantly with this crazy warning where Jesus says, see that no one knows about this. And we've seen this in the New Testament a few times where Jesus heals someone and says, like, don't tell anyone. Don't tell them. And um, Michael J. Wilkins says this. He says, although miracles will attest the authenticity of his gospel message about the arrival of the kingdom of heaven, Jesus does not want crowds to clamor for the miracles alone or to think of him simply as a messianic wonder worker. He is the savior who has come to bring salvation from sin. So these miracles were meant to be a sign, but not the main attraction. Jesus wanted to reveal that, yes, I am the Messiah, but to heal people, that's not the main reason why I am here. I'm here to bring salvation from sin. And here, after that whole, that whole thing, blind men, son of David, you're the Messiah. I want you to do something that's not been done in the Old Testament, but I want you to heal me. Okay, you've healed me. Jesus tells me, don't go and tell anyone. 31, but they went out and spread the news about him all over the region. I have not been a parent very long, but this just is like a huge parent moment for me where I'm like, hey, don't touch that. Why are you touching that? Oh, man. It just like instantly, they go out and they just blab about it. It's like, it makes sense. These are, we're blind people and they are probably so excited. Like, like, whoa, I don't know if they were born blind or recently made blind, but sight was given. What was not there before is now there. They are able to see. They are telling everyone in the region. Now, uh, I think it's a little important to point out a couple things about this. Again, Jesus is not about the hype and the hysteria that came with that, but one of the reasons that uh, Jesus told them not to do this, uh, not to go out and tell is I feel like well explained by this uh, other Bible commentator. He says, these two men had faith, and it was in response to their faith that they were given sight, but they lacked obedience. They did not supplement their deep conviction that Jesus could give them sight with an equally deep resolve to do his will. So as I read through this passage, it's easy to just think, oh, a healing happened. Cool, Jesus is showing 
that he's the Messiah, we should believe in him, he's the Lord, and I, I say yes to that. Yes, what we should take away from this is that Jesus really is the Messiah, the Son of God, died for our sins. That's what we should take away from that. But we also should look at the things they said and the things they did. They said, yeah, we believe you're a Lord, but they didn't have the obedience to go with that. So what, what does that mean for us? Again, I think that it's easy to say that, oh man, if a miracle happened to me, I would never turn my back. Or if only like God would do this one thing, maybe I would always follow him forever. It's easy to say stuff like that when you're asking for the miracle, but what happens after that is important. And I think it's not something flashy or crazy. It's simply obedience. The Lord is asking us to obey him. The men believed the right things and said the right things, but lacked that obedience to do the right thing. So what about us? Before I followed Jesus, I was really good at remembering when people did wrong things, said the wrong thing to me, made me mad. I kept a list, you know, all those things like you shouldn't do now. You shouldn't keep like a list of all the bad things anyone in your life has done. That's, we're told not to do stuff like that. But I did that because I also had this other problem too, which was that I tended to hate messing up. So in order to deflect a little attention off of me when I mess up, I would point out and be like, ha, Kyle, you actually are, you steal stuff. He doesn't steal stuff. But I would say something like that to deflect attention off of myself because I hated when I messed up and I would point out the flaws of other people. And I came to know Jesus and like usually like whenever there's like a problem in your life, it's, there's always that message where you're like, wow, did, did this guy talk to someone and uh, know all my problems? Because I, I swear they're talking about me. There was a message in my college uh, about forgiveness and about uh, not holding a grudge and basically keeping a list of all the wrongs someone has ever done to use against them. And I heard that message. I knew that forgiveness was good. I would have even said that probably at that point. Like, yeah, forgiveness is good. Like, not holding a grudge. That's, yeah, that's lame. Don't do that. But I didn't. I still held on to that old way for quite a while. And I'm wondering if maybe some of you guys are here tonight too. You, you know the right answer. You say the right answer. But are you willing to obey? Because again, obedience isn't something that's easy or comes natural, but the Lord is calling us to that. Maybe it's a sin issue. Maybe it's something where um, you're holding a grudge similar to me. Maybe you, you got jealousy or pride issues. Or maybe it's loving that neighbor who leaves their generator on till midnight and you're like, wow, I really want to sleep. Or maybe some of you guys, uh, besides stuff like that, when we are telling you about reading the Bible and Michael's got this crazy cool Bible reading plan, you're like, yeah, I love reading the Bible. Reading the Bible is great. But you haven't jumped on board yet. Man, there's so many things that we can talk about with like spiritual disciplines and things like that that are, we say the right thing, we believe the right thing, but are we willing to obey? And I think the Lord is calling us to that greater level of obedience today. Because eventually, what the Lord was molding my heart like over many years. After, I don't know, probably like I came to know Jesus and like three years later, finally, another message that sounded like it was meant for me and the preacher was like talking directly. I swear he was saying, Mark, you should do this. I 
finally listened. I finally listened. And I went and I talked to uh, some people that I uh, said some things to and apologized. And it was hard. It didn't feel like a mountain like was moved or anything like that. It just felt difficult. And the Lord continued to say like, Mark, keep going, keep going, keep obeying me, keep following me. Because I think the reason uh, that this passage, especially maybe I'm preaching mostly to myself here, but maybe the, the reason this passage is so important is that it's easy for us to like believe something and say that we're gonna do it, but it's even harder to go and do it. I, I believe that the Lord is asking us to be a part of this ushering in of this kingdom. And it's upside down, it's a little crazy. The, the weak will inherit it, the, the meek, the poor, and it's worth giving up everything once you are a part of it. But man, I think as we are chasing after Jesus and trying to become more like him, it takes obedience. It takes that denying ourselves, saying no to yourself and saying yes to Jesus. And this is a message, again, that you probably have heard before. Yeah, we should obey Jesus. I believe that. You believe that. But are we going to go do that? Are we going to say yes to Jesus in all areas of our life? Not the easy ones where it's like, yeah, I'll go to church. But will I wake up early and spend a moment of silence, of stillness with him? Will I hold my tongue when uh, I want to get really mad at someone? Will I choose to love someone even though they're not lovable at all? Those are the things that the Lord is asking us. Will you obey me? It takes obedience. So as the worship band comes back up here, um, I just want to pray and just ask you guys, will you obey? It's super it's not like a crazy application at the end, but I believe the Holy Spirit loves to talk to us. He loves to be uh, whispering things to us, and maybe it's the same thing that we've been de denying for a long time. Oh, But I know that he is speaking to each and every one of us tonight.